Okay. Uh, this is the first time I'm trying to use Zoom, so appreciate your patience. Um, awesome. So uh, thanks everybody for joining for the you know, Llama Index and MongoDB workshop and Fireside Chat. I'm super excited today to have uh, Andrew Davidson as well as Prakul uh, join us, uh, both for the Fireside Chat as well as the workshop sessions. Um, for those of you who aren't able to make the event, no worries at all. This is uh, also recorded, so we'll just be sharing this as content uh, for for uh, you know uh, you to enjoy after the fact as well. And so, um, without uh, uh, with that said, like we could probably we can get started. So the high level agenda is uh, we'll probably just go through a high level intro and overview of uh, MongoDB. Uh, and so we're super excited to be working with uh, MongoDB uh, on the Llama index side. And we can talk a little bit about some of the high level aspects of Mongo as well as how it integrates uh, with the Llama index. And so Andrew will be presenting some of the overview side. I'll be presenting an overview of some of the storage abstractions. And then um, Prakul, who's a senior product manager on the machine learning side at MongoDB, uh, actually we, we've prepared like a, a notebook that we can run through to showcase how you can use Llama Index with Mongo um, to um, basically create a kind of like a, a data powered like chatbot uh, using LLMs. And then uh, for the last 35 minutes, we'll go through a fireside chat with Andrew. Uh, and so there's a lot of exciting topics to discuss at a, uh, at a high level. Uh, and we'll be going through some of um, general topics around some interesting aspects of open source. And so, you know, MongoDB started off as an open source project. How did it grow into this successful company? And I'm sure there's a lot of relevant lessons that are relevant to uh, founders and the genre of AI space as well. Cool. So that said, uh, these are just some very basic slides. Uh, Andrew, do you have uh, some initial things to share? Sure. Yeah, Jerry, great to be here. Hey, folks, I'm Andrew Davidson, SVP of products here at MongoDB. Been at the company over 10 years now. And I uh, I was originally thinking I would just do do conversational, but I did just whip up some quick slides that I could conveniently use here. So why not? Let me just quickly share. Sorry to put you on the spot. If, uh, if... No, no, this is great. <laughs> this is great. Uh, so a lot of people probably, you know, have, I, I have to hope that almost everyone here has heard of MongoDB, but you may not use MongoDB every day or, or may not be something that you're as familiar with, or you might have an outdated understanding of it. And I wanted to just throw up a couple of slides to kind of talk about our strategy. Our core strategy from the very beginning has always been anchored in developer productivity. We've always believed that we live in a time in, in the software industry, or frankly, in the economy at large, where we're increasingly in a software defined economy. And if we're in a software defined economy, we're very much in a developer defined economy. And that's kind of an exciting moment. And so our core thesis of developer productivity from the beginning has been anchored in this idea that developers spend most of their time wrestling with state, wrestling with data. Uh, and so if you could unlock a more natural way of, of working with data for developers, you could truly innovate faster, build software faster, build really interesting game-changing new use cases like what's happening now with Llama Index and, and so many other generative use cases uh, or many other types of applications over the years. So we believe that this, this idea of building in tables, this traditional relational database centric world that we live in that dates back to the, the, the limitations of computing in the 1970s. By, by the way, a quick aside, if you're not familiar, uh, the reason we put data in tables in the 1970s is that the key cost bottleneck in computing at that time was the cost of storage. And I always ask people, what do you think the key cost bottleneck of computing is today? And I would argue it's developers' minds. It's enabling people to move as fast as they can think. So really, our core thesis is the market needs something different. Uh, and of course, we believe we have an offering that is relevant to that, a true platform for innovation. We think a key platform for today is centered on three key themes. The first is that it must have an elegant developer experience. And for us, that elegant developer experience is centered in the idea of rich document experiences on top of all the programming language communities that you could build with, whether you're a, a Java developer, a .NET developer, a Python developer, C Sharp, uh, Ruby, or, or Node, you should have an idiomatic experience in any framework of your choice, or if you're building with any upstack capability, like a Llama Index, we wanna make sure that we're really elegant and native for you. But behind that document model is the superset of, of data models. Essentially, if you think about it, a key value store is, document with a single index, 
Relational is essentially a flat document. So we think documents, the lingua franca of our time, the way we all think about data is such a critical differentiator for today. Documents are flexible. I can adjust my indexes and many other things. But it's not just enough to think about the data model. The second key thing is that it needs to be possible for me to be able to drive a wide variety of workloads behind those documents. This starts with transactional, traditional operational transactional use cases, but it, it extends to search. I should be able to bring the full power of inverted search indexes to bear behind those documents and app-driven analytical use cases, rich aggregations. And I should be able to do all that in multi-region, globally distributed, device-centric use cases and serverless abstractions. And it should just all be in the same package if I want it. And all of this should be built on a global, scalable, highly resilient foundation available on all three cloud providers, Google Cloud, AWS, and Azure. So that's basically our core thesis. We conceptualize ourselves with our core business centered on our database as a service in Atlas. We conceptualize ourselves as a developer data platform uh, because we think there's so much more than just what we think of as databases. We're defining a new category, developer data platform, to think of, uh, of the unique uh, way we obsess over developer experience when it comes to operational state. So that's my uh, quick intro for the platform. I, I really appreciate being here and, and so excited by the work you're doing, Jerry. Awesome. awesome. Thanks so much, Thanks Andrew. So much Andrew. And, and so I guess with that said, that. we can um, kind of get started on uh, talking a little bit about how uh, Llama index storage abstractions work. And then uh, at a very high level, we'll talk about how MongoDB fits seamlessly with these storage, uh, storage abstractions that we've created. So going back into the, the slides, um, this is just like a very basic architecture diagram um, showcasing you know, how Llama index works. And just at a very high level, the idea of Llama index is to allow you to you know, for, um, kind of integrate and, and augment your language model with your own private data. And that private data can be stored within some storage system, uh, such as a document store like MongoDB. Uh, and the idea is that your, your data probably lives somewhere in like raw files, APIs, workplace apps, or already in a database. We provide tools that allow you to first store that data, then define the steps to index, retrieve, and query over that data so that we can basically connect your data source into the language model to allow you to build various types of end user applications. For instance, like question answering bots, chat bots, and knowledge agents, and, and a bunch of other things. So this occurs in a few different stages uh, from converting from your source data into a format that you know, basically solves this kind of retrieval augmented pipeline. And you start with like these source documents, right? And the source documents uh, require some sort of storage solution. And so we'll get into that in just a bit. It's a pretty natural integ integration point with MongoDB. Then you get into the indexes over these source documents, which define different types of views of your data. And the reason defining different types of views of your data are important is because, you know, as the language model, if you want to have a retrieval model operate over your data, you need to be able to identify the relevant documents or relevant to your query. And so indexes store the state that allow you to do that in certain types of ways. And so one example of this is, for instance, having like a vector index that allows you to index different types of data with embeddings. Another is like keyword index, which allows you to index your data with different types of keywords. From then on, um, you'll, uh, we have this idea of like a retriever class, which allows you to basically retrieve different types of data from you know, an index or just with your own custom retriever to retrieve the relevant nodes given a query that you might have. Uh, and a query is basically an input prompt. And then um, you, you know, uh, we wrap this in this overall query engine abstraction, which can call you know, retrievers and indexes under the hood. Given a query, it can retrieve the relevant nodes from the corpus and also synthesize a response. Uh, and then the, the result is that we are able to build this overall uh, kind of query engine over your data uh, using language models. And this uh, query engine is a very powerful abstraction that can do a bunch of different things over your data. Uh, it can answer questions, it can answer more complex queries, it can summarize stuff for you, it can also solve tasks for you. So fundamentally, just you know, with the architecture that we have, the storage part is, is quite important. And we've thought a lot about how to create the best storage abstractions. We have the document store, which allows you to store these text data chunks uh, from the source documents. And the key thing here is that you know, it could be using a memory store or it could be using MongoDB. 
You can also store the indices themselves in a in memory store, or you can actually store them uh, in in like Mongo as well. And then the the, the um, all both the document and the index store sit on top of like a key value store, which is this like base abstraction. And so uh, it's a very flexible interface. And MongoDB was one of the first uh, uh, kind of like classes that we implemented the subclasses of the interface. Um, but the idea is that we provide these very basic uh, stored primitives that allow you to store the source data. And then once you store this data, you can then use it within Llama index uh, within your language model application. And so here's just an example uh, using MongoDB as a document store and index store. That's a very high level overview. Um, we've come out with a blog post uh, today uh, with uh, kind of uh, Prakul led the effort on that. And then without further ado, I think Prakul, you have like a basic notebook example. And I think all these resources will be shared in the, uh, or have been shared in the Discord, Twitter, et cetera. And so these are all things that you can look over on your own as well. Um, oh, quick note about questions in general. I think um, feel free to put the questions in the chat. We might not have time to get through all the questions for, for instance, for the workshop or, or also the fireside chat. We're also happy to answer this offline and feel free to hang out in our Discord too. Cool. All right. Hi, everyone. Let me share my screen. So I will be walking through an example of how we can connect your private data to large language models using Langchain and MongoDB. Uh, for this particular example, uh, we want to go over this particular paper, which is a GBD4 technical report that is about 100 pages long. Now, this is essentially an example of a private data, which is not part of the large language models, for instance, the GBD4. And this paper came out in 2023. Um, uh, so the thesis like, you know, once you have data which is newer than when these models were trained or you have data in your company's repositories like your Google Docs, your presentations, your internal wikis. Uh, how do you use that to connect it and be able to use English to get chat GPT like responses? In this case, um, we would firstly like you know, want to go over some of the initialization part, uh, which is about getting these initialized. Um, so start off with loading your document. Um, Llama index provides connectors for various data sources. In this case, we are using the PDF reader. Um, for then point on, we want to convert those documents into nodes. Nodes are Llama index construct that essentially chunks your documents. Um, in this case, we would be executing this um, and you can see that those 100 pages of the PDF have been con converted into about 107 node chunks. Now this process is at this point nodes live in memory, but as you can imagine, as you continue parsing and ingesting more of these documents from your various data sources, uh, this will not be able to scale and you would need to use our database to be able to store these uh, documents. Uh, on nodes in Llama index terminologies. So MongoDB is something that can be used with very basic abstractions. Uh, MongoDB document store is something that's initialized and part of Llama index. And you can get a forever free MongoDB Atlas account uh, following the tutorial here and in, in just a few steps. Uh, Atlas really allows you to manage these data sources quickly gives you great uh, interface to manage and query as well. So once it has been initialized, uh, you would want to add your documents at these nodes, some index nodes as part of like MongoDB, which can be done in just like two lines of code. Um, as we proceed through this, uh, you would realize uh, this is something that starts getting populated uh, within um, Atlas. Uh, right now we are at 58 documents. As it continues processing, uh, all the different documents or these nodes gets keep on chunking into like MongoDB collections. Moving on from here um, is where you can, you would want to initialize some indices on these uh, parsed ingested nodes. So to be able to persist your indices, um, there are just a few lines of code where you can define which MongoDB uh, Atlas URI you want, what database you want, 
And from that point on, um, you would proceed to define these different indices. So once we would be using for this example, our list index, vector index, keyword table store. Um, as you can see, these will also be persisted into MongoDB. Now, the advantage of this is this ingestion is something you need to do only once. And for all the various downstream applications that you would build, you can quickly initialize and point your query Lama index query to point to this MongoDB instance. This is a small example. We want to see retrieve nodes from MongoDB doc store and see if we are able to uh, like, you know, get this as a basic verification. Uh, it's the same number 107 nodes that were retrieved from MongoDB. So this really helps you cut down on the developer effort on managing this yourself, as well as makes it cost effective by not calling those LLMs or like in this case, we are calling OpenAI it tokens. Um, then we want to move on to proceeding to some kind of query. So the first query we want to be getting on is how does uh, chat GPT-4 do on bar exam? So for this kind of a query uh, is what we would be using um, the document on, oops, there is some issue on my end. Oops, sorry about that. Um, okay, so always a life challenge. <laughs> But I think if you run the collab notebook, it should work uh, for what it's worth. Yeah, on yeah. The, on so the we also list. have a yeah. collab notebook where it's working and the, these are listed on the blog store as blog post as well. Um, yeah, so for these kinds of queries, we would be going through how chat, does ChatGPT4 do on bar exam, get a response there. Um, yeah, I think I missed something up on my end. Um, so yeah, proceeding with like other queries that you can see on the company blog post. Um, and yeah, that is, uh, this notebook is something that we'll make available after this call. And these are part of the debate list, so. Great. Um, Prakul, could you just scroll up? Uh, sorry, I, I know you just stopped screen share, but there, there is like that key component where you just like basically do service context or storage context from defaults. Um, I think, you know, the one of the key ideas to highlight here is that, you know, most of what Prakul is showing is very much part of the basic Llama index flow. And if you want to use MongoDB, the integration point is actually quite simple. You just basically uh, swap out the document store as well as the index store, as we mentioned in the slides, with uh, kind of like the Mongo variants of it. And then now, you know, your data and then your indices can be backed by MongoDB as opposed to being in memory. And so, um, as Prakul mentioned, it's like free to try out. And so, you definitely give it a shot and, and uh, let us know what you think. And then, you know, if you do run into any issues, please submit an issue on the uh, GitHub or, or Discord, but it, it should be working. Um, I think, cool, okay, I think that's basically the, the kind of like high level run through of the workshop. Um, I think I will probably just paste, um, uh, maybe at some point, the link to the, the uh, slides as well as the blog post in the, in the Zoom chat uh, for all of you who haven't seen this yet. This is also in the Discord as well. Uh, and then you can basically run through the collab notebook on your own to basically uh, kind of uh, get, get a sense of how you can use Llama index with MongoDB. Okay, before I turn it over to the fireside uh, fireside chat portion with Andrew, with uh, which I'm super excited about, um, one kind of uh, let's just run through some basic questions in the chat, maybe in the next thirty seconds or so, and then we can uh, get started. Cool. I think um, Josh asked uh, how Llama index abstraction relates to or um, is, is different from Langtrain. I mean, I think in the end, like these are kind of two frameworks for um, uh, we're, we're a bit more focused on kind of like doing search and retrieval over your data. And so for us, especially as a storage solution, um, having good storage interfaces and being able to define that state makes a ton of sense um, because we want to kind of like create a really nice interface on top of your private data. Uh, and so for us, like this uh, tutorial that Prakul just showed really is uh, representative of that, of how you can plug in different storage solutions, basically add my state to your L1. And then the next question I'm gonna answer before we turn it over is, um, if we use Mongo to store the index and document stores, wouldn't large documents uh, cause problems? Um, yeah, I think that's potentially true, but I think the idea is that we will, um, this kind of like happens after the, 
document splitting too, because the idea is that we store the nodes and the nodes typically you specify like text chunks, right? So you store the text chunks in MongoDB. Um, and so that that's uh, the, the way we treat Mongo as a storage layer. Okay, uh, let's get started with uh, the fireside for, uh, fireside chat portion with Andrew. Yeah, great. And, and thank you, Prakul. That was great. The the, the demo gods they uh, they do their thing. But really, uh, I actually hadn't seen that. I hadn't seen the full demo myself yet. So that was really really cool. But uh, good to be here and shift gears. And I might ask some questions back at you, Jerry. But I'll yeah, say that sounds great. I think, uh, yeah, it's not just a one sided thing. Feel free to yeah. uh, make this into a discussion, too. Um, but I think, you know, one of the key things that now that we have you here, Andrew, that I think a lot of listeners will be interested in, and I'm also super interested in, is just maybe you could kind of like give us a little bit of the origin story of MongoDB, right? Because, you know, to some extent, MongoDB is like a precursor to all these like generative AI startups popping up these days that are open source or not, you know, like there's a lot of companies in their relatively early stages uh, trying to figure out like the right business models and generative AI. And it's kind of interesting looking at an uh, interesting parallel in like the database world. And, and maybe you could trace a little bit uh, back into the history of MongoDB and how it got started. Totally. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And that one of the reasons why I'm so excited to, to, to be talking with you and seeing the the level of, level of excitement and, and activity going on in the domain is that you can just feel that you can feel that feeling uh, that that I can personally just I, I can't get enough of it. So yeah, in the early days of MongoDB, fun, most people don't know this, but actually the company originally, the founders at the very beginning were not even envisioning delivering a database at all. They were really envisioning building a platform as a service play, full stack platform as a service. And they realize that if you're going to have a platform as a service that's going to have at its core a next generation developer centric database, which was anchored on the document model, they always believed in the document model. They always knew that that was key for developer productivity, like I talked about before. They eventually realized that uh, trying to build this platform as a service with a whole new database in the mix, that the database part of it, because operational state is, is just so hard. Uh, they realized they could never do it all and they had to stay focused. It was like trying to get into space and focusing on, you know, a bunch of the ancillary bits, but actually the rocketry was going to be the real key focus. So they had to, they kind of realized, you know what? Okay, we have, we've got something really compelling in the database portion. Let's refocus ourselves there. Uh, and, then, and they started getting just mind boggling levels of, of community adoption uh, at a time, frankly, in which we all kind of look back and, it's a combination of chuckling and also feeling anxiety and fear over just how much people built on MongoDB, frankly, well before it was ready for anything serious. People in those early days were doing all kinds of stuff. And, you know, frankly, we, we pay a reputation uh, harm for that to, to this day, to some extent, something that we're always trying to move beyond, if you will. But why was there just this crazy level of interest in building stuff well beyond what MongoDB was ready for in those early days. Mm -hmm. It's because in the same moment that MongoDB hit the scene, a major platform shift was happening. Basically, the, the exact same time AWS became available for the first time. In those days, if folks remember, we didn't refer to it really yet as cloud. We, we were kind of talking about it as it's commodity hardware. And commodity hardware was this concept at that time that we knew Google had pioneered. And Google was not as, I don't know, savvy as Amazon to realize, whoa, we're on we something big here at that moment. Amazon goes out there and starts selling commodity hardware as a service. And the reason I bring all that up is I think in that moment, this platform shift, nobody really understood what it was going to mean yet. But basically, a bunch of virtual machines available as a service in isolation is not that powerful for a developer. What mm -hmm. MongoDB did, two peas in a pod in, those, in that origin moment of cloud was say, Hey, can I turn a can I use a distributed system software to turn a bunch of VMs, commodity hardware, into a developer relevant API with a document? And all of a sudden, you make this new platform shift extremely powerful, and you satisfy this incredible need. A lot of shadow IT, a lot of crazy things being built, a lot of amazing things being built. Right, right after that, the mobile revolution launches, the new platform shift, and MongoDB kind of launches geospatial capabilities and kind of, again, got this double platform shift of cloud and mobile that very much led to just crazy levels of adoption that we were able to use to invest in mission criticality, transactionality, and all the other stuff that 
over time kind of, you know, the adult pants version of a database was formed over time. Yep. I bring all that up because I think there's a lot of parallels with what's you can kind of feel what's going on now. We're seeing mm-hmm. people feel like we're confronting a new platform shift, new primitives, new concepts, generative AI, large language models, whatever you want to focus on within that. And building the right developer abstractions that make that accessible in this moment, you're going to see people doing so many amazing things on Llama Index. So, And you're going to have so much anxiety over it too, aren't you? But it's going to be pretty cool too. And then it, over time, it'll it'll mature. So there's a lot of parallels. Got it. I have a lot of follow-up questions to ask, but that was a, that was a great intro. Um, and one of the things that you mentioned was uh, it was, it, it seemed like uh, there were challenges, uh, especially with uh, so much interest in a tool like MongoDB that you felt like there were points where you felt like it wasn't mature enough for, you know, like uh, production use. Uh, what were some of those challenges? Was it the fact that MongoDB uh, was storing a lot of like uh, state, for instance, and state is one of those things that is potentially hard to migrate off of once you add data to it? Yeah, I mean, I, undoubtedly state is state is is the fundamental problem, right, of computer science. So, you know, we, I would say our issues were more, that we we in our in our era of being a very much a software that you run centric business in those early days our software didn't come in with that much opinion and it's hard by the way with self managed software to come in with too much opinion that's one of the advantages of, of the shift to saas is that you can bring in more opinion but when we when we had kind of no opinion you know we did things that put a lot more on the builder on the developer and that's okay if you really have a, you know, if you're, if you're, if, if the builder is someone who's super controlled in an enterprise environment where they have a lot of governance and controls, or they have people who've been, who really have expertise in knowing how to make, make sure that they're doing things in a well-tested or sort of safe and secure model. Uh, mm-hmm. But I, I think in those early days, you had a lot of people who just didn't, you know, because it became so easy, they were building without necessarily having the maturity methodology, the testing harnesses. MongoDB in those early days had serious issues of locking in concurrency, uh, our storage. You know, eventually we we actually did an acquisition of a of a company that had built an incredible industry leading storage engine called Wired Tiger. That was something that we were able to plug in to get to to move away from some of the concurrency limitations that we had. And eventually we implemented a raft like consensus protocol for our replication, rather than the somewhat bespoke earlier replication that we had. And then eventually we introduced more advanced sharding, which this is our, our strategy for horizontal scale out uh, in ways that was w- where basically there was less of an overhead on the on the overall production cluster so that you could make those changes. So, you know, we kind of realized each step of the way our customers are shooting themselves in the foot. We got to do things to make it easier for them. There did come a point, though, where we kind of realized no matter how good this becomes as software, because there's so much challenge for our customer in managing stateful mm-hmm. software, even if we make it really good software in a distributed system, that's so hard to orchestrate. We realize we have to go up a level of abstraction and make the whole thing a, a service. We have to go all in as a company in that. We had this realization that we will end up losing to databases that are less good, that are delivered as a service if we remain as pure software. Uh, and it was really our customers that made that clear to us, right? They, they're just like, this is... It's too hard. Got it. Got it. Um, that's super interesting. And I, I do want to dive into that uh, in, in, in just a bit about some of the challenges and like productionization. Um, in the meantime, going back to the early days, how did you uh, engage? And this is almost like a meta point, right? Because, you know, Llama Index is also like an open source uh, project. And, you know, uh, we have a, a big community and a lot of people are using it. But how did you engage with like open source community throughout the early days of MongoDB? And, and what were the key aspects that kind of like generated a lot of user obsession uh, with the product? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's obsession. You have to be just obsessed with talking to everyone using your product in any way that you can and talk to them on every medium you can. In other words, doing stuff like this, exactly what you're doing, which is so great. Uh, you know, we were all around the world. We started creating community groups, kind of very viral uh, MongoDB user groups being run in cities everywhere in the world. And we would try and, you know, visit as many of those as possible. We would find members of the community that were building, you know, programming language drivers and really give them that pedestal, have them be the, the run, the person who runs a MongoDB user group in their geo. Uh, and, and a little bit later on, once we started 
you know, building, raising some capital and kind of becoming, becoming a company, we would hire those people, people who had built key parts of our programming language communities or other parts of the sort of open source ancillary uh, parts of the experience, bring them into the company if they're interested in joining it. Uh, but in terms of the, the, the users who were building on it, you know, every forum, whether it's, you know, Stack Overflow, Google Groups, Jira, we were just these days, obviously Discord and, and every, every, every other forum, just obsessively trying to be there and be present. I, I describe it as doing the unscalable. I mean, I even challenge my team to try and do this today. It's stressful though, but it's kind of like, if you feel like someone is really there using your product, using your, your open source software, if they're actually there, then that gives you, I think the, that gives you the, the, the wherewithal or the energy to actually just lean in and, and talk to them. Eventually it starts feeling like you can't support it and you start scaling out and maybe create a support team or a community engagement team and other things. But we just obsessively realized it's a bottoms up strategy. Developers, shadow IT, it's always gonna be that. Uh, it's never gonna be a top down sale like certain other kinds of industries can be. And so just being on the pulse of what your people are experiencing and doing, it's not only super helpful to make sure that they're successful, but it's, it's what allows you to understand whether your product is moving in the right direction. Product management essentially requires you to be operating this way. Uh, and, and I'll be honest, there was a time in which we sort of started almost feeling too insulated from it. We started monetizing in the enterprise a bit. We started realizing we could lose our entire North Star as a company, which is, has to be anchored on the developer, the builder persona for us. And mm -hmm. we realized we have to go back to that. We can't just have a bunch of people that insulate us from the developer experience. That would be, that would make almost make us so blind to what matters most that we would move in the wrong direction and just care about central control personas. And so we had to do some readjustments at times. Got it, got it. And and so like this obsession with uh, developers and just making sure that you're solving some of the core use cases, I think is, is so important for this like bottoms up approach. And so uh, going with this idea of like uh, aggregating like usage statistics and feedback, and I, I imagine this is pretty relevant for uh, some like founders, right? Uh, who, who might be viewers. Uh, how, how did you like aggregate and try to iterate on user feedback? And how does this like potentially differ from the ways you like potentially iterate on feedback? if you were building like another SaaS product? That's a great question and point that it is the perennial challenge of someone who delivers shrink wrap software. You just want to know how people are using it and you can't get, oftentimes you don't have that phone home uh, instrumentation. I think these days people are more comfortable with form, certain classes of instrumentation or phone home usage, usage analytics uh, than they maybe were in the past. But I think it, it's so important to be kind of clear about the nature of what that is. We traditionally, with our community offering, have never had any kind of built-in phone home in it, and at the same, and so it was it was challenging. We didn't, we, you know, we we felt somewhat blind. We did at one point introduce a monitoring capability that people could opt into that allowed us to understand a little bit more about high-level attributes. But there's simply no doubt that you know once you're in a SaaS posture. On the one hand, you know, there's so many governance challenges to think about. We'll talk about those in a moment, I'm sure. But undoubtedly, the ability to, to, to really know how people are using your products in a way that allows you to not only you know, know who's using what so that you can see what's most popular and double down or innovate, but also to be able to interact with and talk to people about different parts of your product offerings. It's just game changing in value for both the customer in the end and the product teams involved. Makes sense. Um, I'm taking uh, the, the the next part of this, I think, is related to a lot of the stuff that you've talked about with respect to uh, like the enterprise versions. Uh, and and so um, it, it seems like, you know, you've already talked a little bit about how MongoDB has evolved from this like, you know, great open source tool into this uh, enterprise grade uh, tool that's used by a ton of businesses. And maybe just like taking a step back, you know, for any sort of open source project in the developer space, maybe you could help like listeners just give it, get an overview of the different types of like open source business models uh, that people uh, just generally think about when they're thinking about like potentially turning an open source project into a business. And then maybe after that, then we can talk a little bit about more specifically like um, kind of the uh, like kind of some of the focus uh, areas from and the transition period from like thinking about pure open source to uh, thinking about like the business model around that. 
Yeah, you know, a lot of people building a business model around open source start out with a model of more or less selling support or professional services, which is a, a great start. It becomes a challenging type of business model to sustain long term to the extent that you sort of feel like once your customer becomes an expert, do they do they really want to commercially, you know, have a relationship with you anymore? Maybe they don't need to. Uh, some of them do because they they want to keep ensuring that you're investing in your own product because they benefit from it, et cetera. But there's some risk of that model in isolation, though. It's a good start. What often happens is folks will end up building, you know, an enterprise version, uh, maybe a, a version of their software that has special capabilities. I would caution that if you're doing that, it's super important not to gate in that enterprise version. The things that are most important to your growth persona, the people who are implementing you, like in our case, it wouldn't really make sense to, to sort of put a, a paywall in front of a developer experience because we know the developers want to take advantage of building on us. You know, once you're doing the kind of enterprise version and perhaps you're actually trying to monetize by selling that to what are basically enterprises, uh, the, in other words, the kind of people who might be willing to feel that they, they shouldn't use something without those enterprise bells and whistles, well, you don't want to, at that point, lose sight of the fact that many of your builders or users or customers are not going to be using the, are not going to be care about those enterprise bells and whistles for various reasons, especially if they're security oriented bells and whistles. Tons of people are going to use your product and they, maybe they're not a bank. And so they're not willing to just pay because of the security feature. So what could, this is that moment of extreme risk where you could start losing your North Star and start thinking what matters most is satisfying the bank and I'm only going to talk to banks going forward. And now I, you know, I'm going to do only security features from this day on and lose sight of kind of the core developer audience. If it's a developer product, right. the advantage of SaaS, of course, is that you can add a full value prop. You can manage everything for the customer. Uh, but the challenge with SaaS is you're not going to be able to go after the enterprise on day one because they're not going to trust you. You know, the big companies trust big companies, medium-sized companies maybe trust big mm -hmm. and medium-sized companies, small companies trust small companies. So, you, you know, you have to start somewhere. You start at like the solo developer, you start in the small to medium-sized companies, and you earn that right by demonstrating what you're doing, time in market. You start going through the, the third-party security audits and validations, and you sort of earn that trust from a security and battle-tested, you know, reliability perspective, reputation, and you go after more and more sophisticated customers. So the challenge mm -hmm. is, how do you do, if you're going to, if you're the kind of, kind of offering where you know you need to do SaaS long-term or you want to do SaaS long-term, how do you do that while continuing to grow your community in, in the enterprise and or in the long tail elsewhere across two to three of these offerings without feeling like you're spread too thin? This is the perennial mm -hmm. challenge. It's a lot to do. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of uh, relevant questions, I think, uh, for both like Llama Index as well as projects in this space too. And, and I'm kind of curious, like, um, just uh, for, from like the MongoDB standpoint, um, how long did you focus on kind of like the community open source uh, side of things? And uh, maybe there was like a timeline from, for when you did start thinking about commercial offerings as well as like just organizationally how the, the company evolved to handle uh, both community growth as well as, uh, you know, the, the go-to-market motion to, to tackle enterprise. Totally. I, I, we didn't really start focusing on an enterprise variant until a good five or so years into the company journey. And even from there, when we first started having an enterprise variant, it was very limited at first. And eventually we kind of had to try a couple of different per permutations to really get to the point where we had something that we think that we felt was truly compelling to sell in the enterprise, probably took another couple of years. Uh, and so we, you know, to be honest, we were spending a lot. We had raised a lot. We were lucky to be able to do that. Not everyone can necessarily do that. Uh, we launched our SaaS offering pretty late. Like we only realized probably by 2014, 2015, we need to go all in and build it as a service offering in Atlas. We launched it in 2016, just under seven years ago. And I think if we had it to do again, based on what we know now, we probably should have started the SaaS offering earlier, but we were able to pull it off. We were able to really reorient the company and kind of really change the DNA of the company throughout uh, over a five-year horizon. It took us five years for Atlas to become the majority of our company revenue. Now it's about mm -hmm. 65%. And I'll tell you, the culture shift to, to 
go from being a company that gives people software that they're responsible for running to being a company that's on the critical path for something critical and a comp and a mission critical part of a customer software right, right. state is profound. The the speed, the expectation from your customer, how quickly they could come in and be gone before you even knew they had come in and they tested you and told you that it didn't work or it mm -hmm. did work. Whereas in the old world of software that they ran for themselves, you might not heard, have heard from them, but they moved a lot more slowly. Everything changed. So we had to build kind of a new set of muscles throughout the company, new way of operating, new operating rhythm. If we were SaaS from the beginning, maybe we would have kind of always had that rhythm. I'm not sure. It's interesting. Got it, got, it. got it. Yeah. So yeah, super interesting, super interesting questions around. And especially, you know, uh, every period I feel like has their own unique time. And for, for you guys, it's basically kind of coming as this void of the cloud and SaaS was taking off and you had to evolve to fit that market. And I think I imagine like for a lot of the, the tooling in this space, it's just like evolving to fit all the advances in trend of AI that are happening and really thinking about once you go one step beyond that, how do you get uh, capture value, right? From, from enterprises as you are to build a service that really does scale to kind of like um, uh, to, to something that people would be willing to pay for as a service. Totally. Um, cool. So I guess like um, uh, there, there's a ton of questions I'd love to ask a little bit more there. Uh, that being said, I do also want to talk a little bit about some of the kind of like AI strategy, especially in today's world for, for MongoDB. And so maybe just an initial question is just like, <clears throat> excuse me, how is MongoDB, like how, how is MongoDB being used in ML workflows too, right? And I'm curious to hear your thoughts about like both the MongoDB in the traditional ML world, the generative AI world. And of course we can keep the discussion. And I know you had some questions that you want to ask me as well. And this could be like a fun back and forth. Yeah, well, it's super interesting because we 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 each have a, a lens from a particular vantage point in the stack, and so I'm definitely going to turn the turn this one around on you. But I am of the opinion, and you know, I, I've been waiting for this moment for a long time. I think we at MongoDB have been waiting for this moment for a long time. It feels like we're finally in this moment where it, sometimes people refer to it as the shift left has arisen, where now developers can build with these capabilities in a way that previously they were a little bit more limited to what I sometimes refer to as kind of the ivory tower, the ivory tower machine learning and data science world that was typically partially an organizational problem in many companies. Oftentimes that ivory tower group was this central team far removed from the line of business software application teams. And oftentimes those people over there wanted to add value directly into the applications in the software, but they were oftentimes organizationally too far removed to do it without a huge amount of laborious effort. And so they typically would end up focusing on maybe like very specific business problems and they were doing their thing. That's great. But I think there was something wrong. And what I think we've been kind of waiting for is this moment in which you could really see that, that the ability to build with these new capabilities needed to be something that was in the two pizza team, whether that means ML engineers and data scientists are in the two pizza team building the software application, or whether it means that some of these capabilities become more like libraries or you know, solutions like Llama Index that make it easy for software developers to not have to be a machine learning expert, but to build with these capabilities. We've been waiting for this moment and it feels like it's arisen in the last six months. So it's really exciting. I think you know, you, you've come from one that the, the ML world and are now kind of building into that other world. So I'm curious to get your take. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a very interesting point. And I think like one um, aspect of traditional ML is that you typically, you know, like in college, you have to take like machine learning courses, you basically have to get a sense of how ML works. And then like, if you're a machine learning engineer in industry, you have to get a, a sense of like a certain workflows, for instance, like, uh, you have to like gather a data set, like add labels to it, like do cross validation, you have to train the model, you have to evaluate the model, you, you basically have to pick up some basic skills, uh, both like in data science and, and machine learning engineering to be able to, you know, use this in practice. And I think like, one thing that's very interesting about generative AI is that because the models themselves can just be used out of the box and can be used almost on like a zero shot or a few shot setting, um, the accessibility to a lot of users is just way higher. Like you can just use it as an API. And then as a result, if you look at like ML research, and it's kind of interesting if you look at like recent ML conferences, like a lot of the papers on large language models are almost less about like kind of like, you know, 
uh, tuning the, the model itself and almost more about just like building these like software systems on top of these models, um, it kind of starts to have a lot of properties just like building a software system. And as a result, I do think it, it just makes it a lot more accessible to a lot of like other types of, um, a, a lot of, uh, a wider range of developers as well. Right, and I, I think that part is, is uh, super interesting. And so I guess like maybe a question here is like for, for MongoDB, like how, how is uh, MongoDB kind of more on the storage side of things prepared to, to, to uh, handle this type of world? And, and how, like what, what are kind of like initiatives that MongoDB is doing to try to like, you know, um, uh, kind of like uh, help define this uh, new stack around Toronto of AI? It's a great question. Uh, there, there's many layers to, to my answer. So the, the first is, I, I, because it's something many of my colleagues are asking me as well. And I, I, here's what I would say to just sort of baseline this, this topic. The, I, always, I remind my colleagues who are not familiar with this term that you are familiar with, which is that in machine learning, there's this term called ground truth. And you know, the ground truth kind of refers to the idea that there is the real world mm -hmm. and there is the digital understanding of the real world, which needs to be baselined to ground truth in the real world. And I bring that up to say that one, one way to think about software is that software is the bridge or portal between the real world, the ground truth, and the digital understanding. Mm -hmm. And operational data, operational data stores like MongoDB, MongoDB Atlas, are how software lands that digital understanding into the digital, into the digital world. The only way the digital world can keep up with the continuous change and dynamic way that the real world operates is to have this operational data store that software can use to, to keep up with all the concurrent updates and the inserts and reads and writes that are all happening at once. Sounds kind of obvious, but the key point here is software applications are the center of action with respect to where you put where you put any kind of generative or traditional machine learning to use in a either customer facing like a human facing way or in a software on top of software use case. Which is a long winded way of saying that in the old world of ML effectively what was happening was you would generate data from software in this operational data mm -hmm. store. You would often pull it out of that, go do some labeling, training, figure something out, prove that there's value to add, and then you would put it back into the software. Mm -hmm. And it would be basically enriching some aspect of your application in some way, whether it's yep. predictions or personalization or any number of things. And in the new world of this, you basically don't have to deal with that full loop anymore. It's kind of like you could take advantage of, uh, of models that are already there that, that are general purpose enough, but you still need data that comes in from the real world or that's baselined into your private data, kind of in line with what you're doing or a combination of the above, which is really what, what you're doing with Llama Index. And so I think ultimately it's for us, we, we need to understand that operational data is central to this. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's kind of like we could rest on our laurels and just do nothing. And this is a great trend for us. But of course, we have to do a lot more. That's why we're here. We're, we're, we're front and center and understanding how are people building, what stacks are being used, what frameworks are being used, because we want to, you know, we want to understand what primitives do we need to introduce to make sure that we're making it even easier to do all of the things people are doing. There's a lot of uh, research and experimentation in vector databases, as you know, in the industry right now, we're looking very closely at that. Uh, there's questions around inference. Am I going to run that myself? Am I going to use a third-party mm -hmm. API? Do I need to do yep. support all of the above? Our general MO is not to bring in too much opinion in the app tier because we want to enable a thousand flowers to bloom, any number of ways of building. So we're mm -hmm. trying to kind of understand what are all the different ways that people are going to build like Llama Index and make sure that we we work uh, well with all of them. Yeah, it makes a, it makes a ton of sense. And, and I guess like this is kind of the, the last question that uh, I'm just going to raise. And this uh, brings on a point you mentioned about like, how you know operation data, operational data flows through the data stack in this new world of generative AI. And this is kind of like a general question I've been thinking about as well. And so no worries if, if you don't have like a perfect answer. But the idea is that um, how do you think like like this, like the data, modern data stack is pretty complicated. 
right? Like there's like a ton of services at like a, a bunch of like different levels of, of like the, the, the data sector. You have like storage systems, you have like data injection pipelines, you have like ETL, reverse ETL, right? And then you have like, you know, all these different types of tables. I'm kind of curious, like, how do you think uh, language models or uh, kind of more generally this idea of like AI enabled agents and automation can help like redefine uh, ETL or just like different components of this data stack? That's been a question that's been on my, on my mind for, for a while. It's an interesting question. I have an, uh, maybe a uh, unorthodox answer, which is to say, when you talk about the data stack, you're typically thinking about it through the lens of non-operational, non-transactional data. Like when people talk about data stack, they're often talking about what is sometimes referred to as analytics and the whole world that exists sort of downstream from the software application. Mm -hmm. I bring that up because there's so many players in the analytics space that are talking about that, that are doing ETL, ELT, mm -hmm. data engineering, all that kind of stuff. Not, nothing wrong with that, that's cool. Mm -hmm. But we kind of tend to think, you know what? We focus on this other area, which is what basically where software directly interfaces with data. Mm -hmm. uh, again, going back to the developer. And I think our uh, you know, philosophy or approach is to say, what if I can give the developer the primitive in the engine that allows them to do more right there in the software without having to go deal with the ETL at all? So a basic I example see. of that is when we layer in extremely sophisticated search indexes powered by Lucene on the back end of Atlas, we make that something that we do all the management of that on the back end, all the synchronization of the data, the movement of the data. Customer doesn't have to worry about it. What they see is simply a query that they push down to a special class of index using a dollar search operator, for example. And so mm -hmm. our approach would be, how do we avoid them needing to do all of this ETL by putting it in one place? I think that that paradigm is a better fit for what we need today than a world mm -hmm. in which you're going to go do all the ETL. Now, don't get me wrong. All that ETL and downstream data plumbing, it's its clearly not going away that we need that. We're gonna, always going to have data warehouses where we do roll-ups and reporting. I just think the center of gravity for machine learning will be less down there and closer to the software with this shift. And I think certainly a lot of the code assist type uh, generative use cases will make it easier to do some of the expressions of those pipelines. But that to me is almost I like see. a so it's almost like a unified data store for more tailored for software development. And you're right in that, like there's an entire stack for analytics, right? Like all the, a lot of the ETL stuff is to kind of like dump it into these tables that eventually translate into like a BI tool at the end. And then it serves this like analytics use case. Well, yeah, and like to, to make it slightly more explicit, you know, some data platforms focus on things like ingestion and ETL as, a, as like mm -hmm. hugely critical to what they do. And I would point out that those are the ones in which they need to go get data from somewhere else. The equivalent of that for, for us, for example, for an operational data store is the software writes the data into the data store. Like it, it doesn't need to be necessarily ingested from some other third-party service. It's like you wrote a piece of software in, in the programming language of your choice that generates the data. And it's just a different mindset somehow. Makes a lot of sense. Okay, awesome. I think this is a pretty good time to wrap up. Uh, and so want to thank you again, Andrew, for the, for the time to, to do this fireside chat. Thank you for cool for helping to uh, author the blog post as well as uh, do a showcase of the, of the notebook. And um, I know there's some questions in the chat and I know some of them are kind of more related to uh, the, like the actual usage of uh, like MongoDB with Llama index. And so if uh, you do want to, please feel free to post that in the discord and we'll kind of like continue the discussion there. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And we'll make sure to share this video on uh, YouTube and Discord as well so that uh, you guys can uh, look at it later. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us, Jerry. This was great. For cool. That was awesome. Simon, good to good, good to see you. Thanks, Eugene. Great conversation. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Farquhar. Thanks. All right. Bye, guys.